father then, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my butt? Yeah. Oh, Talk about it. <laughs> of course, I don't know that he ever lived in Fairhope, did he? Yeah, he did. He did? Yeah, he, uh... Well, he, 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 he built a house down there. It would be better, yeah, oh, save man. it going around. Oh, okay. I'd forgotten that. Yeah. Where Dick Turner lives. And, uh, he built a house there and had raised chickens there. For several years. But for a good while he lived east, didn't he? East of town. Yeah. Then from there they moved out east of town. That old, the old house is still there. It looks about like but that was your mom's dad. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I never heard yeah, anything about your dad's folks' family. I didn't meet him because he died when dad was 16. And okay. Died when he was three, so that's good. Okay, we're here tonight with uh, Ken Wallace and his wife, Phyllis Wallace. And uh, Bob Schneider and Flo Schneider are here. And uh, Bob Schneider and Flo Schneider are here. And Kenny's going to tell us about um, his dad and how he, how Kenny got Fairhope and all about. His dad did a lot of fishing, and we want Kenny to talk to us about the bay and the fish and what his dad did and that sort of thing. So take it away, Kenny. <laughs> tell us first, Kenny, how where you came from. Where y'all, your family came from? Well, I was born in Stockton, uh, above Bay Manette. And we moved. <laughs> oh, do Don't know. rock or you'll be, uh, <laughs> you'll be giving everybody a headache. <laughs> I, this chair is here. Yeah. Um, we moved to Daphne when I was about six years old and um, lived there till I was about uh, 15 or 16. 15, I think. Uh, that was um, about 1942, my folks moved to Fairhope, and we started going to school at the organic school for my last three years of high school. Mm -hmm. And all my brothers and sisters, I have four sisters, and later on, two younger brothers. Mm -hmm. And we all, all attended the organic school. Yeah, and you were all good dancers. I remember that. Oh well, yeah, we were dancers. <laughs> you were good. You were good dancers. <laughs> but um, when did your dad came first? When y'all first came here, what did your dad do? My dad was uh, had fished most of his life. Every once in a while, he would take some time out and get a different job, but he always. Went went back to fishing. He loved it and uh, a doctor told him later in life that being in the outdoors and in the sun was probably what kept him healthy and the reason he was alive when, because <coughs> he was gassed in World War World War One. Oh my heavens. And there were scars on his lungs and they said that uh, just being outdoors all the time probably kept him from getting TV or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he uh, came, his father was a fisherman on Real Foot Lake in Tennessee, and uh, he came to Alabama with his father when he was young, around 16. His father contra contracted um, yellow fever in Mobile and died. My uh, father was about 16. His mother died when uh, when he was only three years old, so he hardly knew his mother. What year was your dad born? 19, I mean 1896, uh, I believe. Mm-hmm. So was it 1899 that they had the uh, epidemic in Mobile? Does anybody know? I don't remember. I don't remember. Okay. Uh, whether there was an epidemic or not, but there was always a lot of yellow fever. Yeah. yeah. So after that, he eventually joined the uh, army and went and was sent over to France in, in World War One, and <coughs> almost lost his life there because he was found by some French Frenchmen and lying in a ditch sick. 
Mm. Uh, they uh, got into a house there, and this woman uh, nursed him back to health. And uh, he's, he was already <coughs> always remembered her and tried to find out through the mail something about the place, and he did uh, contact a postmaster in the town, and he did tell them tell him something about her life, I mean, mm -hmm. the family there. <coughs> but her name was Marie, and so that's the reason they named oh, Marie. Oh, that's your first, his first daughter. Right. Was named Marie, yeah. Right. So, um, he felt that she had saved his life. So. Anyway, he came back to uh, the U.S. and at one time, he was a fireman for a while on the railroad in uh, Tennessee, and then he came back to Alabama. And he was fishing, and Mom's father was a fisherman, so somehow he met the family. And uh, I guess the first time he saw Mom, she was just a little girl, because since he was about 11 or 12 years older than Mom. Mm -hmm. But um, he, they, they married when she was about 19, and he must have been uh, 31. So. But uh, he always told people that he caught her on a snag line, and, and he figured <laughs> she was worth keeping. So <laughs> he was always kidding like that. So, um, but he said good things came in small packages. Yeah, she was small, <laughs> wasn't she? <laughs> yeah. She is small, I should yeah. say. But um, the snag line is one of the one of the things he brought from Tennessee to Alabama. It was the first person that we know of that ever fished a snag line in this, at least in this area, probably in Alabama. Can you describe that? The snag line is similar to a trot line, only where a trot line has. Uh, hooks about every three to six feet, a uh, snag line has hooks every ten inches. And it's just what it says it is. It's a snag fish. There's no bait put on the hooks. The fish run into the hooks and are snagged. Mm -hmm. And it, well, now, is this on a pole or is this... The, it, the lines are about... A section would be about uh, 500 to 1,000 feet long. Oh my with goodness. hooks every 10, ten inches, uh, hanging down about 20 inches mm -hmm. on a smaller line. And the fish would be swimming along and, and swim right into it. And uh, it was especially um, good for catching uh, paddlefish or s most people call them spoonbill cat. Spoonbill, we usually call them spoonbill here. They're really a paddlefish since they true name. And there used to be a lot of them in the rivers and bays. I don't know. I don't think there are a lot of them left, but no one fishes for them, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. But do they, do they? Do you eat them? Yes. Okay. They were. He uh, was one of the few people around here that caught them and shipped them in barrels to New York because you could get an excellent price in New York because they smoked them up there, they're excellent smoke. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he would put them in barrels with ice on them and sh ship them on a truck, and the truck would stop in route and re-ice them. So that's what they They didn't have refrigerated oh, trucks size. very often, then, so they were shipped all the way to New York in trucks and ice. But that was the main fish he fished for, for I mean, uh, catfish and uh, spoonbill. Weren't mm -hmm. paddlefish too very much sought after because of the roe? Right. That was the other thing. There, the roe of a spoonbill is equivalent in quality to the sturgeon ca uh, caviar. So mm -hmm. it is. A, it, he uh, also was one of the only people I knew in this area that knew what to do with it. So he would. You have to separate that roe from a membrane by rubbing it over a fine mesh, hardware cloth, very, very fine mesh, and the eggs would separate, fall through to 
all separated. And then uh, he would cure it by adding the right amount of salt and putting it in gallon cans and leaving it for so long. And then he shipped it to a caviar company in St. Louis. And uh, there were some other, other fishermen here that fished for sturgeon, and when they got a sturgeon with roe in it, there was a lot more of it. They didn't know what to do with it, so they'd always bring it to bed to deal with it. Um, but Dad never did catch uh, a lot of sturgeon. He caught a few small ones, but he mainly caught fish for the spoon. Because mm -hmm. at a time when, say, uh, fish like redfish and uh, sp speckled trout were selling for about 25 cents a pound here, which was a good, good price then, he would get 40, 45 cents a pound in New York mm -hmm. for the spoonbill. And people here really didn't eat the spoonbill that much. They didn't think they were all that great. Right. They yeah. are good fish, though. But um, did he, was that still more, more money uh, considering the shipping charges, or? Uh, the shipping charges weren't all that bad, so he made pretty good money. That was back in the good old days, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> really. And so it worked out pretty well. He started out fishing in the rivers for those, but he found out that in the winter, as the fresh water came down the bay, uh, the spoonbill would come down with the fresh water, and usually be right close to the line of the fresh and salt water so he would follow them down and no one else ever did that uh, because it was quite a lot different fishing in the bay than fishing in the river because of the weather and the wind and mm -hmm. everything else but he learned to deal with it and uh, we i fished with him when he followed the spoonbill all the way down to the Bonsecour where the Bonsecour River comes out. And by fishing right where they were uh, feeding mm -hmm. on the, near that line of fresh and salt water, he would just load down the boat with them. Um, I remember the big <coughs> catfish that he used to catch back then, too. I remember coming in one day with about a hundred pound catfish. Good heavens! And uh, he kept alive. The catfish were easy, easily kept alive, so he had a live box that's in the water. And he put the catfish in there and kept keep them alive. Till the now is this season. a freshwater cat? Yes. Okay. The blue cat. And so how, how big is a hundred pound catfish? Well, it's twice as big as a fifty pound. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, like, can you show me with your hands? <laughs> well, about, oh, Wait four, a minute, let me get my camera <laughs> aimed here. Whoops, can't move anything. Four or five feet long. Of course, being a fisherman, don't take that long. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, oh, dear. They were, they looked very big. But he had put them in those trap of uh, those tra uh, cages and keep them alive until somebody came and picked them up or, or he took them to the market. Usually he had a big ice box uh, for the fish that he near the beach and would put them in and keep the mice down until uh, he took them over to the market. Did he take them to Mobile? Or did he took them to Mobile. Uh -huh. That was That was when you could you could get big blocks of ice easily, and uh, um, ice was cheap. Mm -hmm. So uh, I remember having to when, uh, fishing in the winter time when it was freezing weather. You had to get the w fish to the ice box and get them ice down before they froze because frozen fish weren't considered to be any good oh. if you let them freeze. Uh -huh. So if you iced them down, that kept them from freezing. Well, Just like spraying peaches with yeah. water to keep yeah. them from freezing. Um, 
I can remember, remember when I was really young going to Dad. We'd leave early in the morning with a, he had about a 20 foot skiff, really fishing skiff. And uh, we'd leave with a little outboard motor. They didn't have any big outboard motors in. About a five horse motor was a big outboard motor. Yeah, and we'd go up the Blakely River up to where the Blakely and the Tensaw River joins at Gravine Island. And there were, my grandfather had built a fishing uh, camp there. And we'd kind of stay there for a week or two weeks fishing and icing the fish down in the big fish box. We'd, we'd have that boat loaded down going up with ice. Well, now you couldn't keep <coughs> keep those fish for two weeks. Well, uh, probably, well, yes, but with the ice, you could. The spoonbill kept well uh, iced and kept fishing. But, but wow. I'm not sure, they, when they got enough, they would go down the Tensaw River and then we'll be on taken by boat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, I'm not sure if they kept them for the full two weeks, but we could, uh, we sometimes, we were up there sometimes for two weeks at a time. And that was exciting for me at that time. Yeah. You were having yeah. fun fishing. You didn't pay attention to the business end of it. <laughs> right. Fishing with the snag line, do you have to know what depth the fish are running? Yes. That's an important thing. Because uh, you use uh, buoys and, and weights so that you can weight it down to the, if you, you know about where they're feeding, and so you weight it down to the level where they have to be running. That was an important thing. Um, how do you figure out how they're running? How deep they're just, You just learn. <laughs> 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 I never knew for sure. Dad knew. Oh, okay. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the fisherman's yeah, story. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the fishermen always tell you where they catch the big ones. Right. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a fish story to but, me. Later on, he, um, as the fishing got worse, uh, he had to find other ways of making a living. So when the fishing was bad, he quite often start, uh, would catch crabs. There were still, still plenty of crabs then. And the way they caught crabs then was to put out a long line, about a ro small rope about a mile long with uh, bait looped in it about every six to eight to ten feet and then they ran that thing and dipped the, dipped the crabs off as they came up they you mean they'd come up to the surface and get the, the when they pull the pull the oh, rope up okay, the crab okay. would come up mm -hmm. and you dip the crab and yeah. keep going on yeah actually they started running them with a uh, out, small outboard motor very slow and they had an arm out, and that rope would go over the arm, sticking out from the boat, and you could see the crab coming up. And they used a, a dip net made of wire so they wouldn't get tangled up in it. And then you dip it and throw it in the tub or the box or whatever you had. And as they came up, and sometimes the line would just be crabs there almost every bait. Wow. But the, that was before the days of the crab trap. And now all the, all the crabs are caught with tra crab traps. But Dad was the first person to ever fish a crab trap in Mobile Bay, too. He found out that he knew they had crab traps on Chesapeake Bay. And so he got, somehow got a name of somebody on, in, there and wrote them and got them to send him a crab trap. And they were basically made out of uh, chicken wire with, just like they are now, only uh, now they're made out of that coated wire. So he began to make them out of chicken wire. And of course, they didn't last too long. They had to keep making them. And uh, so that's how the crab, crab traps got started here. Hmm. Um, they were so he was the first one to first use them. First one to use them. On and the he, then bank. he made some and sold them? He made, he, he made them, and then gradually other people, I think, just started making them. You know, oh. some before you knew it, uh, a year later, the, the manufactured 
traps came in with a coated wire and that type of thing. But he was the first one to really use one. It was all because he was always trying to find out about new things and new ways of doing things, and that's, that's what he did. And he used to pick out that crab meat and sell it. Then they, they got okay. to, uh, he and Mom got to cooking, especially in, when the off-season of fishing was, they would catch crabs and then they would pick them out. And Mom would make gumbo, and she had quite a business selling gumbo oh. and uh, uh, stuffed crabs. Mm -hmm. uh, she'd clean the shells out and make uh, uh, stuffed crabs. Yeah, that's a devil crab. Yeah, devil um, yeah, I remember Mother buying crab meat from and her crab dad. Meat, yeah. So, but back in the early days of fishing, um, you could leave your boat, leave everything in your boat. You could even leave, leave an outboard motor on your boat. You could prove, you didn't have to worry about people bothering the tra uh, tackle or anything. Nets were hung up on the beach and on the poles, the trammel nets that they caught um, mullet with, would just be hung there. Nobody bothered anything. Once in a great while, somebody might bother something, but not very much. Uh, but as times changed, it got toward the end of when Dad stopped fishing. It got so bad you couldn't leave your boat anywhere. You couldn't leave anything anywhere. Mm -hmm. and and that was that was when did he stop fishing? Um, uh, must have been. Around 1970, I guess. Mm -hmm. I don't think he did a lot. They did some. They did do some crab uh, crabbing after in the 70s, maybe. But I think he basically stopped fishing around 1970. Mm -hmm. It was getting getting worse then. People would tear up your nets or whatever. Uh, you could just couldn't leave. Couldn't leave anything out. Yeah. Well, he, uh, along with all his fishing and all, he wrote, didn't he? Yeah. He's, back in the early 30s, before he started fishing, when they first moved to Daphne, he, it was around 1933, because I was around six years old, he was trapping uh, muskrat in, uh, in the marshes. He would walk about five or six miles to where his trap lines were and then uh, trap all day long in the marsh running running trap lines and setting new traps and come in at night with the muskrat hides and have to sit there that night and put them on stretchers and peel the excess fat off the hide and everything. That sounds like a hard way to make a living. <laughs> and during that time, while he was trapping in the marsh, he got to writing poetry. And uh, then later on, in, uh, after later later years, he began to write articles for newspapers and um, yeah, newspapers and uh, magazines and a lot of the wildlife hunting, hunting and wildlife magazines. Plus, uh, he wrote quite a few stories for Ford Times about the experiences with Model T Fords. And uh, so he, he had, has quite a co collection of various articles. That some were just short stories. But short he, stories? Mm -hmm. uh, fiction? Fiction. Oh, okay. I didn't know he wrote fiction, too. He did a few, yes. Uh -huh. But he was completely self-educated because he only went through about the third or fourth grade. Mm, that's amazing. Yet he probably knew about more about history than I did after four years of college. So. <laughs> we won't say where you went to college. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't say that. <laughs> of course, I didn't major in history, but <laughs> he loved history. Yeah. So he, uh, he, he used to read a lot. I can remember my, some of my earliest memories were 
we had a big churn with an asher that you had to churn butter. Mm -hmm. He know. would be sitting there churning that with a book in one hand, reading his book and sure. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so always reading. Oh man. So he also got involved in uh, Fair Oak in the little theater when it was started in about forties and fifties. And he really liked the he was in numerous plays. Mm -hmm. um, I can I can remember one humorous thing that happened to him that I always laugh about when I think about it. Um, he was. We lived on Pier Street, and down at the foot of Pier Street, where the boat launch is now, he used to leave his boat there, but it was at that time he had to get things out of his boat when somebody might get it. He had the, his outboard motor, he, first of all, he was wearing a pair of slicker pants with uh, straps like a, like a farmer's overall, overalls, but uh, this was, they had a coat too, but this was hot in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And so he had them on over his underwear because it was so hot. And it so happened there was only one, one strap wouldn't catch, so he only had one strap over the shoulder. And he had his, he <laughs> got out of the boat and he picked up his outboard motor in one hand uh, he put his oars over his <coughs> shoulder with the other arm, and there he got in the middle of Mobile Avenue and that other strap rope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a predicament. There, there he was. <laughs> so he said, I just walked spraddle legged. <laughs> Cars coming by over to, <laughs> to the other side before I got. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was funny to hear him. Oh, I bet he was. I bet he had the whole town talking. <laughs> Back then. Yeah. But he would he would leave those over at the service station over there, the same one that's there now. Mm -hmm. Monk Green that had it then. Yeah, yeah. He'd leave his outboard motor noise over there, so he didn't quite make it to Monk Green. <laughs> <laughs> when that happened. <laughs> and your folks lived on Pier Street yeah, for right. many, many years. Your mom still, from, still lives from there. From 1942, mom still lives there. Yeah. And, uh, That's 53 years. Yes. Okay. This year. Mm -hmm. uh, the other, another funny story I remember about Dad was he was just, he must have been about Seven, 70s or maybe near 80, I don't know. He was in the hospital. And uh, the nurse came around the, to, during the day and asked him if he had had a BM. <laughs> Dad thought, he didn't know what she meant by that, but he had, he had the light came on and he said, he thought of the pills he'd taken that morning. He said, yeah, I had a little green and a little blue one. <laughs> and <laughs> someone asked him, well, what, what did the nurse say? He said, I don't know, she rushed off. <laughs> I always laugh. <laughs> he didn't know what that terminology was. <laughs> oh, that's funny. He loved to tell stories. Was, mm -hmm. he, uh, <laughs> he had a good sense of humor. He had a too. real good sense of humor and, and uh, loved to tell stories. And that was the worst thing later in life when he just, a few years before he died, well, he, he couldn't communicate. Mm -hmm. and that, that was the worst thing that could happen to him because he loved to talk. Yeah. But he, 
he never was a bore, but because he, he was he was so interesting. Mm -hmm. And then he had Parkinson's. Yes. Okay. And your mom cared for him at home for years. For years. Yeah. And I don't know how she did it. I don't either. And she's now eighty. She's eighty-seven. Oh my. Now. Is she still planting she's, a garden? She's still going to put a garden in. We're not going to let her, we're only going to break up a little bit of ground and keep it small because mm -hmm. we know that she can't do very much. She's, she isn't as active as she was a year ago. Yeah, well, four years ago she gave me the best turnip greens I've ever eaten, so oh, I'll remember them to my she dying day. always loved the garden. And so both of them. That that reminds <laughs> reminds me of another story of a jaybird that turned up around there, and it must have been somebody's pet because uh, it did some really crazy things. If mom started feeding him in the morning, and because he was he just come out up and take it out of her hand, mm -hmm. and one morning she went out to the clothesline. She hadn't fed him, so she he came and lit on her head and started pecking. Oh. Her head. <laughs> Mind her, she hadn't paid it. <laughs> but the funniest part uh, was that Dad was out planting onion sets in the garden, and he was about halfway down the road, was just pushing the onion sets in the, into the ground. He turned around, and there was that jaybird coming along, pulling them out. <laughs> oh, for heaven's <laughs> sake! <laughs> they had more funny stories about the jaybird. Mm -hmm. The time he picked up a cigarette, but somebody had thrown on the ground and threw up in the tree with it in his mouth and was still smoking. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to believe, but that, they said. He wanted to <laughs> He stole their knit, knitting needle they were knitting with on the net and threw up in the Put it in his tree. net? <laughs> oh, my <laughs> goodness. What a precocious jaybird. Yeah. Mm. How old was your dad? How long did he live? He was 92. Uh-huh. And he had uh, been ill for? Oh, five or five, six four, years. five, four, six five. years. It was, you know, it came on slowly. Yeah. And just, it's progressive. So, um, for three years he'd been quite, uh, just uh, at least three or four years. He couldn't... Uh, get around himself. He had to yeah. be, and he couldn't communicate very well and he couldn't get, a, get around so he had to be lifted out of bed with a lift and put into a wheelchair and rolled out, lifted out of his wheelchair again and lifted into uh, with a hyd uh, hydraulic lift. Mm -hmm. and that's about the again. And he loved to sit out on the porch so mom would get him in she could handle it, all this. She could get him out of the That's bed, amazing. And put him in his chair, and then get him out of the porch, and take him out again. But just think of the time, mm -hmm. rolling him out on the porch, taking him, put him in his chair, and getting him in there, doing that all over again, and taking him back in. Yeah, yeah. How you get that done, and then do everything else yeah. that needs to be and done is amazing. It's, uh, her, especially her. Age. How she did it to her, mm -hmm. she was eight, she was in her. She was around 80 then, mm -hmm. early 80. So. Got any more funny stories? Probably are. I probably have some. I can't remember. Can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's. We'll stop a minute and let you think. Published uh, articles in uh, the Ford Times. Mm -hmm. And uh, field and stream and various sports magazines. Like Argosy going. On. Argosy. He did several uh, stories for Argosy. Um, he also the Fairhope Courier published some. Yeah, he did some stuff. Things, some things that were published in the Courier. Because I remember um, reading them. <laughs> yeah. Aside from that, I can't remember very well on uh, any other, what other publications. Mm -hmm. So he wrote one about the, his experiences with the Model T Ford. Yeah, he, he loved to talk about the Model T Ford and the 
one story he wrote was about having a Model T Ford on a raft and rigging up some up some kind of a paddle wheel system to to uh, propel the boat from the motor of the Model T. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how it was done, but he <laughs> he rigged up <laughs> some kind of paddle wheel system to drive the the raft. <laughs> but it's, I wish I had. A, I hope we have a copy of that. Yeah. The one story I remember him telling about the Model T, I don't know really if you have this, but he took a trip with a, mod, a borrowed Model T Ford, and, and you know they had those coil boxes that uh, for the spark, that, uh, the uh, box, that's coil, what they call coils, and then they furnished the spark to to make the mo <coughs> motor run. Well, coming back, the thing stopped, and he pulled around with the coil box and got it going again. And it would start to stop, but he found out if he kicked the coil box, <laughs> it would go again. So he came back, I don't know how many miles, and he kicked that coil box almost all the way home. <laughs> Every time it looked like it was going to stop, he started kicking the coil box. Oh, my goodness. Um, he said with, a, with some bailing wire and a felt hat and octing and laundry soap, you could keep those things running. <laughs> I'd like to know how you... <laughs> he said he, he's used a felt hat to make a um, band for the clutch system, whatever kind of clutch system they had on them. He, uh, he did that once, wire things together with a bailing wire and they, they got a gas leak. He always kept talking and wound us up in his boat when he had an outboard motor in case it was a gas leak. He just kept, put a bunch of that around and leak and it stopped. Uh-huh. So that was great stuff. <laughs> you could worm dogs with it. Oh, good lord. <laughs> <laughs> worm yourself if you dared, you know. Yeah. Oh, mercy. <laughs> but he wrote um, humorous stories and also serious stories. Mm -hmm. I remember a fiction story he wrote about a blue heron once. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. I was, I was working on a newspaper in Montgomery. I was just going to ask you about your career as a new as a journalist. Or well, I, when, I, when I started going to college uh, in, in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, I needed work to get through college, so I got a job, part-time job at a newspaper, and started out as coffee boy, and uh, worked up by the end of the my four years of college. I had worked up to. Uh, what they call a copy editor on the, on the copy desk, uh, editing copy that came in on the wire and local copy and, and uh, writing headlines for it. Oh, so you're one of those people. Yeah. Who write the headlines. Okay. <laughs> That's what I did. Not misleading. <laughs> but later, uh, after I got out of uh, school, that was the easiest thing to keep working on, and I kept on the newspaper work. Um, there until I don't know, late fifties, mm -hmm. I uh, got a job as news editor in Montgomery on the afternoon paper in Montgomery. That was the Montgomery Advertiser. And it was the Alabama Journal, but it was owned by oh. the same company as the Advertiser, Advertiser Journal, mm -hmm. which is I think it's called now. But. Uh, I was there I was a news editor, which meant I, I handled all the national and international news and uh, did the layout for the front page and uh, had to fill up the paper if, uh, if it was wide open, didn't have enough ads to fill it up. I had to find some, something to fill it up. <laughs> well, you ha in your lifetime, you've had numerous careers, and all of them different. Well, uh, yeah, I've had an issue. Interesting life. In yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just, I just realized uh, sitting here talking to you. Uh, wound up later making shoes and 
Costa Rica for 11 years. And yeah, yeah. And, we, and I'm still wondering why you're not making all our cheese now. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have any cows. No cows, no. okay. So you went from a newspaper editor newspaper, to cheese maker? I, I taught school for three years in Costa Rica, uh -huh. in high school. And, uh, and, I, and I was cheese, managed the cheese plant there for 11 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came back here and became a cabinet maker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been in that about. That's a long time. It's 14 years now. So. Yeah. But it's, it's mm, had an interesting life, if I, even if I haven't made much money. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're but still up walking around and you had an interesting life, you're ahead of the game. <laughs> right. That's one reason I didn't say stay in the newspaper in the newspaper business, I didn't think I would, I probably wouldn't be alive today if I had, because it didn't suit me. It was too, uh, too much stress. Mm -hmm. and, uh, a lot of deadlines, a lot right? Of deadlines. Yeah. And I, I had the worst, probably the most stressful job on the paper, because of meeting deadlines and getting, having to see that the whole paper was, was filled out. Mm -hmm. Local news would come in, and that was it. They didn't have to worry. The state news would come in, and that they would put it on their pages. And whatever was left, I had to find. We had, you know, feature articles that were always uh, put aside for that purpose. Mm -hmm. So at least for the first edition, you could fill it up with those kind of things until some more news came in and <laughs> take it out. So every edition, you had to do some changes. Yeah, that's a that is a stressful job trying to get everything in mm. every space filled and every <laughs> <laughs> and get it on news in. Yeah, on time. But um, <clears throat> that was that was pretty stressful during that time anyway because it was at the height of the racial tensions in Montgomery. Uh huh. During the freedom rides and mm -hmm. martial law for several weeks there had been some tense racial conflicts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Do you remember any incidents in particular that might be interesting to put on the table? Well, the, <coughs> the most interesting thing and probably the most dramatic thing that happened there was when the Freedom Riders came in on the bus and the white mob met them and just beat them up. Oh, my. And you were you? Did you witness that? I didn't wit witness it. I with the reporters that came in. Some of the news newsmen that were there were beaten too. Oh my! So I remember people, newsmen coming in to the um, paper with blood streaming on their face, Jesus. things like that. And uh, so, uh, but I had the job of, of putting all that those stories together and, and put, getting the front page out and it, I wish I had a copy of that page that came out that day. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> we tried to be as objective as possible uh, about it and of course it was obvious that the police delayed getting there, they knew what was happening, mm -hmm. they delayed to get in there so that it would would happen. And of course, uh, this came out, it was obvious in, in the stories that, that this probably happened, and the police, of course, took it out on anyone you know, that, uh, that was, had anything to do with the newspaper. Oh, boy. <coughs> so, um, you had to watch your step. Bad times. Yeah. <coughs> I can remember one reporter coming in, and there was a um, one of the white students that w was on with the Freedom Riders. There was there was a mixture of white and black. And was lying on the pavement, unconscious. And uh, the reporter asked the policeman, "said Has anyone called an ambulance for him?" He said he hasn't asked for it. Oh my! 
mm. you know uh, that, that attitude yeah so it goes for pretty good stones thank goodness we've made some progress since then yeah <laughs> Anything else? I need time to talk. Okay, we'll cut her off. Give you two minutes. <laughs> Tell us about your grandfather and the Gar Hides and what what did he do with them? <laughs> My grandfather uh, was also a fisherman. Let's longer. give his name too. Oh, it was his name was Ozzy Freeman. Okay. O Z I E Ozzy. Okay, almost like Ozzy. <laughs> and of course, my dad's name was Walker. Walker Wallace. And Walker Wallace. But Dad and Grandpa used to call each other John. Oh. And this was very confusing, <laughs> especially when you're a young kid. <laughs> I never understood why they called each other John. Nobody else ever called him John. <laughs> but anyway, my grand my grandfather had it had this idea of doing something with the garfish hides. So he, uh, he would take the, get the hides off and dry them, stretch them out flat so they would dry flat. Then he would glue them to the top tabletops to make uh, gar hide tabletops. That would look very hard surface. That was, it was interesting too. He would just glue them to he any? Glue them to uh, any table either make a, ta make table, a table, table or he sometimes bought a table and, and glued it to, to the table top. Sometimes he would ornament the legs and other with, with individual scales off the hand. Mm. They were, um, I don't know, he might have claimed to, to have gotten a patent on it. I don't he may have tried to. I don't think he ever actually got, got one. But um, he sold quite a few of them. And we used to have one that moms for a long time. But I don't know what happened to Gar Hyde Tiddle Well, that's interesting. He always, he had, he always dreamed of ways of making a lot of money. And he never did, but he came out with some interesting ideas. He never really got it. Uh, got very far with them. Well, that's that's the um, that's the American way, though, is to be able yeah. to try. <laughs> Once, in partnership with someone else, back when I was about six years old, he they were producing a clothesline that didn't need clothespins. It was a double wire and twisted in the middle and had um, coils so that that far apart. Anyway, the twist in the middle, you could stick the clothes into the twist, and stick them into the other twist, and it's, they'd stay there. And then if you get ready to take them down, you could just go out and do it. Jerk them off. Oh, them boy. Out. It was, it was Sounds nice, good. Nice if it was rainy. We had one of those for years and years and years that uh, Mom used, and until uh, it finally wore out. And then dryers came in. and <laughs> Yeah. But, Mom doesn't use dryers anyway. Yeah, well, she, some unless, people don't. Unless it's raining. She yeah. Takes everything out. <laughs> Phyllis would rather do that too. Yeah. Give it a good sunning. But Grandpa had some fruit trees too once, and he decided that if he put oil around them, they keep, keep the roots warm. <laughs> <gasps> And you know what oil does to plants, it kills them. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, he found out real fast. <laughs> it's a strange idea. <laughs> okay. Now you're going to tell us about the good old days when you were a teenager in Fairhope with nothing to do. But <laughs> so what was it you did, Kenny? We were, we were bored one night, about uh, half a dozen of us. And, uh, we got the idea that we could take tin cans and put on the ends of a, of a long string and uh, on both ends and then stretch it across the highway 
And when the car came, we'd pull it up and get caught on the car's bumper, and the car would go down the street dragging the tin can. Well, we did that down near the Legion Club, and uh, unfortunately, we got. And you did it there because they slowed down to come around the curve. Is that probably? Yeah. Okay. But this this time uh, there was a carload of big boys, bigger than we were. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on the. Uh, everybody else was on the bay side, and I was on the opposite side holding the. the string and they took off when the car stopped I, they took off to the bay and I hid behind a hedge <laughs> and hoped that nobody ever find me <laughs> well luckily they didn't I don't know what they would have done to me but they finally got in the car and left so we decided to go out near the old blue light which is a magnolia grill or something like Maggie's, Maggie's it was Maggie's, Maggie's. And that's up at near the, the intersection uh, of Section Street and Volanta right. we went out there and the first car that came, well, the car came along and we pulled it up and about the time it hit, we realized we had a, <laughs> we had a police car. <laughs> we all scattered and Tommy Nichols and I, who stood, got behind the old building in the blue light, well, Mr. Cox got out of the <laughs> car. <laughs> He was the policeman at that time. Sort of headed in our direction to Tommy and I figured, well, we might as well come on out. So we came out and Tommy said, Ha ha, Mr. Cox, we got you, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> didn't <we? laughs> so he sort of gave us a lecture and <laughs> let us go. <laughs> and that's the last time you did that. <laughs> we didn't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, is that the worst you did? The worst I'm admitting to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Y'all keep saying that. Well, I'm going to have to dig around a little bit to see what I can find. <laughs> okay. Um, now, okay, we've, we've covered your dad and some of your granddad and your mom and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now tell us what you did as a teenager. What were the main things you did in Fairhope? Just for diversion. We Except tying tying <coughs> uh, cans onto police cars. <laughs> well, we gave that up. So you gave that up. <coughs> we had to find something else. <laughs> Usually, we were the main thing we did was to spend a lot of time at the bay and either fishing or swimming or or Devil's Hole out at. Uh, Fish River. Fly Creek. Fish River. Oh, Fish River? They had a not, devil's not Devil's Hole. Bohemian Swimming Hole? Bohemian Swimming Hole. I got okay. the wrong name. Okay. Uh, yeah, Bohemian Swimming Hole at uh, Fish River. Mm -hmm. We used to go out there a lot. And um, I was going to mention something else. Oh, the kid, oh, in the evening, uh, we'd all, <coughs> most of the teenagers would gather down at the bay near, at the casino and dance to the jukebox there and spend the time we'd just walk out <coughs> back and forth on the pier or up and down the beach road or whatever there was. Yeah, and it was a pretty innocent time. I mean, yes. We didn't have any uh, liquor. No, there wasn't. And so, of course, there was no, even, not even any, any thought of drugs. <laughs> and it was and not many people smoked. Very few. Very few. Mm -hmm. Especially, especially young people. They were. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, it, uh, everybody just had a lot of fun, and it was, it was a good place for the kids to go. Mm -hmm. Later years, it wasn't so good. They did get beer license, I think, and things did change. That was later on. Yeah. Those were the main things we did. And nothing very exciting. And you, you uh, went to organic school and you uh, 
were a good folk dancer. I remember that. So I imagine you went to the national festivals when they had I went, them. And <clears throat> I went to one national festival mm -hmm. in Cleveland, Ohio. And that was, that was good. Quite an experience. Mm -hmm. After that, we went to Chicago. And this is in Chicago. And three of us went to a play and uh, somehow missed the bus going back out to where we were supposed to go and they had the police looking for us. Oh my goodness. Uh, we finally turned it up. <laughs> <laughs> this day and time, it may never get back. That's the truth. <laughs> okay, well thank you very much, Kenny, for this all this information. We appreciate it. Well, this afternoon, oh, let me see if I've got the time date stamp on and see if it's correct. Whoops. <laughs> this is funny. It's on your white shirt, so I can't see it.